Kannst du machen. Okay. Okay. Video off. Video off. Video off. Audio on, video off. Audio on. Okay. People can hear me. You have your audio here. No, it's over here. Yes. Okay. Can we start? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm unmuted. Okay, this time, hopefully. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I hope all of you can hear me well, and I hope all of you can see me well. Welcome to another GIC talk on this lovely Saturday afternoon. I hope you all already have had lunch and that you are resting now. And on behalf of all of GIC, I thank you for joining us today as well. My name is Jana and I will be your host today. So today, as you know, the title of our GIC talk is, well, the title itself, I may say, is thought-provoking in the least, Dingy Basements, Human and Environmental Factors of Korea's Live Music Venues. I was very surprised when I saw this title as well, and I myself am very much looking forward to this talk, as probably all of you are as well. Our speaker today is John Dunbar from Canada, and he has been part of the Korean punk scene since December 2003, so quite for a long time, and he has been documenting everything with photography and writing. In 2005, he started the Punk Sign Broke in Korea, which celebrated its 15th anniversary in 2020. Congrats. Um, he is also the author of Hongdae Fire, which is a fiction novel about a disaster that strikes at a concert near Hongik University and nearly wipes out Seoul's live music community. He is also general editor of RAS Korea's journal Transactions and the copy editor at the Korea Times. Despite living in Seoul, he is also a contributor to the Guangzhou News and he is the one behind monthly crossword puzzle. So now you know if sometimes I know I have a couple of times been a bit angry when I couldn't when I couldn't solve some parts of the puzzle. So uh -oh. now now you know who to I feel bad to say blame, but uh -huh. no, who to thank for such good crossword puzzles in our Guangzhou News magazine. Okay, this was quite a long introduction, but um, I will also invite John now to turn on his camera and actually start his talk today. Hello, John. <laughs> Hi, you can hopefully see me now and hear me. Uh, so I'll share a screen. Uh, here we go. So now I will just give the floor to you and everyone, please enjoy the talk. As you know, if you have some questions during the talk, please type them in the chat room so, so as not to forget them. We will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation after the talk. And also all the relevant links will be in the chat room. And unless uh, John asks you something, please uh, keep your microphone muted at all times. Enjoy the talk, please, John. And there is one part where I might stop in the middle and ask a question. Okay, but, unmute yeah. yourself, please. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I hope that either of you two can monitor if there's any urgent things that come up. It's yeah. This is just the front page, right? Mm -hmm. That is right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, dingy basements uh, is the term I've always used to describe live music venues. Most of them, not all, uh, are underground. Uh, the only one I've been to in, in Guangzhou was, I believe, underground, right across the street from here almost. Um, and uh, I decided to look at the, uh, the factors uh, involved in, in these places. Human factors is basically ergonomics. 
Uh, so we'll look at a lot of things related to ergonomics and environmental factors is something that came up also. When I started doing this, it was going to be for a presentation for an organization called IASPM that was going to be held in Daegu last year, got cancelled because you know why. It was going to happen this year, got cancelled again, so I don't know. Um, that will be part of the talk though. Okay, so first of all, live music venues, I don't know who's been to them. Uh, you might not know too much about what they're like. Uh, but here are uh, pictures of a couple of them. Uh, generally, these are small, loud, and dark places, like uh, the size of, like, I, I went to First Alleyway, which you all probably know. First Alleyway is larger than these places, generally. Um, often the capacity will be about 100, but if, if a, they actually fit 100 people in, it's very crowded. Stages, usually, sometimes there's a stage that's as high as this table, but sometimes there's no stage at all, and it's just like, the singer stands like among the audience pretty well. In, in some of the pictures, you can see this guy with the bloody forehead. He's the singer of a band and he's just in the middle of the crowd. Um, and over in the lower left side, you can see um, uh, a band playing and they have a little stage, but it's only for the drummer and it looks incredibly dangerously flimsy. I have another picture that shows somebody repairing it at some point, so I, I don't really trust it. Uh, another very important thing, uh, other than uh, this lack of separation, is these are standing room places. Like people go in and they stand. You don't get a seat for the front row or the back row or have to sit behind a pillar. Uh, and that's very crucial to the way that these places have evolved and it's caused a lot of problems. Also alcohol, if there is alcohol, it will be probably not too expensive or it'll be unrestricted and you can just bring in your own drinks from outside. Um, audience participation is generally lively and you'll see people not just standing, but you know, thrashing their head back and forth, uh, depending on the type of music. Dancing uh, or moshing, moshing is a lot more violent type of dancing. Uh, and stage diving, uh, where you actually get onto the stage and jump over top and land on people. Um, something I used to do in my 20s, but I'm in my 40s now. Uh, I don't think anybody would catch me. But uh, yeah, it's a very contact form of culture generally. So first off, before we start, I want to mention uh, just a general content warning. Uh, I don't tend to talk about this using profanity, but we will be seeing uh, profanity in a lot of the images. Uh, so I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but we're also going to be learning about some pretty horrifying things. Uh, I edited out some of the pictures that, act I, I had one picture that showed dead bodies in a fire, and I decided not to show that, and I just got rid of some of the pictures that show uh, vomit. So uh, it'll still be pretty awful, but uh, you're not going to see those things. So I went around and I talked to a lot of uh, venues uh, in the process of getting ready for this, and some of them weren't really cooperative or forthcoming with details. And I, uh, I also want to point out that I, I have de like detected like serious problems with these places. And I really want to make sure that I'm not criticizing any of the owners of these places. I really want to draw attention to their needs so that they can have better environments. Uh, as we'll see, I really don't think the venue owners usually are to blame for any sorts of problems that uh, I'm going to be talking about. In fact, it's the lack of uh, flexibility of local communities that forces them into some of the conditions that we'll talk about. Many of these venues don't exist, and many of the pictures uh, are of places that don't exist anymore. So I feel a little safer talking about them. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, I also am trying to respect the privacy of certain people, but I use a lot of pictures as to demonstrate certain things. So I hope none of those people mind. Uh, you know, uh, I, I really want to celebrate everybody who's part of the music scene. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see how that comes out. We're gonna be focusing mostly on the more extreme music like punk, hardcore, and metal because this is just what I'm most familiar with and it's kind of the most extreme conditions. So uh, yeah, uh, this is a list. When I started doing this, I put together a list of venues. This is every venue I could think of in the Hongdae area in Seoul, uh, grouped into, uh, this is the list I could find of the 90s, about 11. And of them, uh, Club Drug is probably the most famous uh, venue in Korean history. Skunk Hell, uh, Rolling Stones. These are the only three that I know much about. And I, I know that they were all underground basements. And I don't know about the rest. Um, 2000s, you can see there were considerably more venues. 
which was a problem because as uh, people were creating venues, like we had Skunk Hell at one point, and then suddenly we had Club Spot and Sapien 7 and Three Thumbs and all these places, but we didn't have a bigger audience. So we had more venues, you know, a lot more bands, more bands had opportunities to play everywhere and the same amount of people coming to shows. So places started closing really fast because there were too many of them. And in the 2010s, here's the list, it's even larger. Um, this is a little bit more diverse also, and not all of these places are devoted live music venues. These three in black here are very unusual because they're not venues, they are practice rooms that were turned into venues by musicians practicing there. The room that we're in right now is about the same size as a room where a band and like 30 people would fit, if you can believe it. Um, yeah. Then down here, these five, uh, you can see by their names that something else is very unique about them. Uh, House of Red Rock, Legend, Hall, Legend Comics, or Hanatur V Hall, KTNG Sang Sang Madang, Yes 24 MU V Hall, CJ Aju. They are all uh, corporate run and corporate owned. A great deal of these closed early in the pandemic because this was kind of like a corporate social responsibility thing of these companies. And they were like, oh, this is too much. So they closed it. I think KTNG Sang Sang Madang is left. I think that's the only one. Um, in fact, uh, V Hall was recently turned into a climbing gym. So live music venues everywhere else. I tried my best to uh, list them for the entire country. And um, there's a lot. First of all, this is the rest of uh, Seoul. You can see four here in Mule Dong, which is where a lot of Hongdae musicians ran to about 10 years ago to try to escape gentrification. Uh, Itaewon has quite a lot, but it's culturally very separate from uh, these people, um, largely because it's an entertainment area that's in the past uh, has a history of being unfriendly to Koreans. Um, it's an entertainment district that has a history of uh, you know, US military. So it, it has evolved very differently even though it's Korean musicians are, in, are frequenting it more. Other areas all over the city uh, and eviction venues, which I'll talk about near the end if we have time. And then every other city, Busan, Ulsan, Gwangju, I have a list of eight. And uh, thanks to Melina, I added Nirvana and Loft 28 to it recently. These of course are venues uh, that um, had ever existed. So if they've closed, they're still on the list, obviously. Um, I was looking forward to going to Speakeasy tonight, and I'm quite sad that I'm not. Uh, but also, of course, some of these are restaurants that have hosted live music, which makes it a very difficult thing to uh, track them all down. So I think this list could grow quite a lot, especially if you expand the uh, scope of live music to other genres also. Um, so let's go on to my research. In order to do this, I uh, wanted to go to live music venues, but there was a pandemic happening. So uh, I ended up going to about three or four in total, but also I, I was able to, I've been to some of these places enough times that I was able to answer all these questions, almost all of these questions based on memory. Uh, so I, I selected about 15 or so, and I filled out all of the answers to all of these questions, which was quite a lot. As you can see, like I look at the name, uh, uh, some of the stuff about status, like how they're registered, which was impossible. Nobody would ever really answer that question for me. Um, you know, type of crowd, uh, location, how easy it is to find, size, which is generally usually pretty small. Uh, important of note was what floor it was on, and we will talk about that, of course, very soon. Uh, other things like bar facilities, food served, Anything, like even the menu is important when we're looking at these things. Washroom location cleanliness is a very critical part of um, this music scene because, well, we'll get into that. And also stage structure. The stage is at these places, if they exist. How far apart are the musicians from the audience, which is important these days for obvious reasons. Um, you know, things like that uh, I took a look at. Um, and so I, I would do walkthroughs. This is a, a human factors thing where you you go and uh, walk into a walk into a place or or use a device or something, and you give yourself kind of paths to take. So I would find the entrance, go in, pay, see if there's a drink, uh, go see the band, find a washroom, go outside, check for evacuation routes, and try to figure out how musicians worked. Like, do they have a backstage area? How do they bring equipment in? 
what needs do they have for like, what did they bring in? Uh, I want to point out the stairs on the left here. This is Skunk Hell in around 2005. This was originally Club Drug and it became Skunk Hell, the second club to bear that name. And the first time I ever came here was on a Friday night. It was my first Friday in Korea in 2003. And I knew I had to come to Club Drug as it was at the time. So I went down this staircase. You can see there are uh, there is uh, no railing here. There used to be. Um, the problem was when I went there at this time, it was pitch black and I had to walk down those stairs. <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, some pretty awful conditions. Uh, this uh, image right here, I don't know if uh, he is well enough known. Is he in the audience? Uh, probably not, but hopefully somebody can shout out his name who's, who's not muted. Anybody recognize this, this bald guy with the uh, twirly things? No? Ryan Berkebile. Yeah, and uh, of course to the right is Bohemian. Yeah, Ryan and I met through the punk scene, so that's how we all know each other. So the I, I've decided to focus on five main points. Number one is noise and noise complaints. Number two is fire safety. Three is hygiene. Four, which I use for an F for because we're in Korea, zoning. Uh, and five is sustainability. And all of these things tie together and like problems with one affect problems with the others. So they are very interconnected. Um, so we'll have a good look at that. By the way, this is Club Drug on that same night that I went down those stairs. Today, it well, since then it became Skunk Hell from 2004 to 2009. Then it became Morier Gautre, and now it is Bender. And it's always had live music capabilities, but it's changed drastically. So let's start with noise complaints because nobody wants to be near uh, a loud concert. Um, but which is strange, if you've been to Hongdae area, you know, it's a very loud place. Like there are nightclubs, there are like stores that play loud music out front. And all of that is okay, but when you hear a guitar that's being played live, police come. Uh, it's just a natural thing. The, the, this shot on the right, upper right, is um, Club Steelface's rooftop with the band Choro Gulko Sonyeondan or Green Flame Boys uh, performing. This actually made it into their liner notes when the cops showed up. Um, but yeah, they were up high and they were not allowed to play up there because, you know, uh, there was a cafe behind the building where maybe customers didn't like the noise. Um, down here, is, there is a little entrance to Club Sharp and we have, you can't quite see, but there's a lot of punks outside. Behind this, uh, down the alley is a very quiet residential area. We got three police cars that night, um, all at once. And uh, this is an outdoor show at uh, Dongmyo in Western Seoul, where the cops were repeatedly uh, responding to noise complaints. Uh, so a lot of these venues, um, their situation is exacerbated. On the left, you can see uh, Club Sharp had a sign and they had a very clear delineation in the alley. You can't go over this line towards these homes or uh, you'll get in trouble. Um, down here on the lower left is uh, a four punks standing out front of uh, Jogwang Sajinguan, which was a studio, uh, a photo studio that doubled as a live music venue and it was headquarters of uh, Jadip, which was an independent music collective. And they're hanging out and across the street, you see a construction uh, fence and a sign and everything. Uh, about a year after this picture was taken, uh, a hotel for Chinese tourists opened there, and suddenly they could no longer have live music because the hotel hated it. And actually, on the 10-year anniversary of my of Broken Korea, I had a show there. It was the last show I ever went to, and one of the people in the show, uh, she was there to support me. Uh, she uh, she wasn't a punk or anything. She went across the street to use the washroom in the hotel, which was a great idea. Um, and apparently, she took too much toilet paper. The cops came. Yeah. GBN Livehouse lately has been one of the, the most favored uh, venues for the hardcore and metal scenes. Uh, the loudest music, and this is in uh, an area I'll talk to I'll talk about in the next slide, I think. But uh, And just recently, next door, opened up a Pocha Hof. So usually when they have shows, between bands, everybody gathers outside. You'll have 30 people standing out there, smoking, getting, getting cheap drinks outside. Uh, so... If this restaurant is open during a show, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. 
so did I? Oh yeah, and uh, I don't have a picture, but Strange Fruit uh, Basement Venue in Hongdae um, has been there since the early 2000s. And about three years ago, I think, a, um, a new venue, uh, sorry, a new restaurant moved in two floors above on the second floor and started making noise complaints about a much older tenant, which was, in my opinion, not a cool thing. The owner was actually, he's a doctor, and he uh, brought them wine as a way to placate them. I don't know if it was successful, but uh, yeah, if you move into a building with a live music venue and then you complain about noise, I have, I have little sympathy. So the easiest solution to all these complaints is to put live music way down in basements. And you can see here, um, these are the entrances to four venues. Uh, you can see very narrow staircases. Uh, but the one on the left is a very large room that has a capacity of 300 people. So um, imagine how long it would take for 300 people to exit through here. There was an emergency exit also. But let's say that 150 people go this way and 150 people go that way. I don't want to think about it. So. On my list of, uh, of all the venues, I tried to count up all the ones. I, I put them into definitely basements, dunno, or above ground, either ground floor or higher. Uh, in the 2000s, where I could, I, I could definitely say 20 out of 30 were basements, and the other 30, uh, sorry, the other 10 were mostly underground. In the 2010s, I don't know for a lot of them, but 27 are basements, seven are above ground. Itaewon, has four basements and six above ground because this is an entertainment district that's used to like soldiers being loud and everything so they can get away with more. Um, Mule uh, has two basements and two above ground, although the above ground don't have shows very often. Uh, these neighborhoods uh, are very important. I, I, I apologize to anybody who doesn't know too much about Seoul, but uh, basically Hongdae was the place where live music just started in the 90s and it was the home to it until about 10 years ago, maybe, where it, now it's just kind of dis dispersed everywhere. And it was a great area. It was a, a university area that had kind of nightlife, but it was still pretty residential. They had a giant playground in the middle where, you know, you every any time that you walked there, you'd, you'd find punks or other musicians hanging out. Um, because of the gentrification, uh, which I'm not going to get into too much in this lecture, a lot of people moved to uh, Mule, which was... Uh, an area full of machinery and factories and stuff like that. Very loud places, um, but also places where at like 7 p.m. all the workers go home. So one of the venue owners, uh, Jong Hee, who ran uh, all three of the Skunk Hells, um, he, he, he went to some of the machine workers and he was like, hey, I hope we're not too loud. And the machine worker said, I hope we're not too loud. So it was kind of like, a match made in heaven, but there are other problems with the neighborhood we'll get into in the future because the buildings are dilapidated, the washrooms are terrible, and it's not a really good place for women. Um, this picture is the front of Jarip, uh, the place across from the Chinese hotel. So you can see uh, if you were if you were going to another country and staying in a hotel and this was across the street, you might not be too happy. Oh, well, maybe if you're Chinese and you saw this symbol on this guy's shirt, you might be happy. But yeah, uh, otherwise, um, not a very good look. So let's move on to fire safety, which is tied to the previous one uh, and uh, a pretty critical thing. So on the left, um, this is the only door to skunk hell, the only way in and out. Um, and this is, this is the frame above it. The owner, jong -hee, was just hanging out here, falling asleep. They had a, a sign so you can find your way out. I tried my best to figure out like which venues have what kind of features like emergency exit, very important, smoke detectors, fire alarms. Yes, most of them have this fire extinguisher. Uh, they do get uh, visited by inspectors often and have to show that. Emergency lights, they can be something like a light above the door that won't go out if there's electricity or portable flashlights. And also importantly, emergency vehicle access out front. Um, here are some other features of the places that uh, are actually very bad to have. Sprinklers, because if you're playing an electric guitar and uh, let's say there's an electrical fire, you do not want fire, uh, you do not want uh, sprinklers activating. Soundproofing, which a lot of places um, like to put in, you know, that kind of egg carton-y stuff. Uh, it is not only extremely flammable, but it also produces toxic smoke, which kills. So um, a lot of places, don't have it. 
uh, they just rely on like building structure for soundproofing. Uh, also, it's important to look at the front door size, the, the size and shape of the stairs, clutter in front of the emergency exit, and also like access control. The picture on the right, um, this is the way out the emergency exit, which also leads to the washroom. And then um, there's a gate and the gate is chain locked from the other side. So if, if there was a fire and I evacuated this way, I would probably have to scramble over this fence. I understand why they don't want to, um, you know, have this open because people would sneak in. I used to sneak into one of the venues uh, through a, a back door area that I think was their fire exit. Um, so yeah, no, no comments. Um, but yeah, you, uh, they have a reason to do that. So I decided to look at some of the historic cases of fires in live music venues. We're going to go through this pretty quickly, but um, I, I looked at Korea Times uh, archive pictures because I work at the Korea Times and I run a project for sharing uh, pictures from the Korea Times. Uh, Daewang Corner Fire was a fire in a building that was kind of multi-use. There were hotel rooms on the top floor and a nightclub. And then below there was like housing. And I think lower down there was, um, there were shops. But Time Club was a nightclub on the sixth floor. And when a fire happened, um, you know, uh, it started to spread from a hotel room and people in the club just weren't aware. They, they kissed to death, it says in this headline. Uh, at the time of the fire, either 64 or 72 people were in the club and in total 88 people died. This is 1974. It was compared to the Dayungak fire, which had slightly higher uh, deaths, but is not relevant here because it's just a hotel. Um, and I, I'm not too interested in hotels, I'm interested in nightclubs. But of all these fires, it's interesting to note, all of them were high above ground and that led to complications with evacuating. Uh, often the windows would be sealed shut, emergency exits would be sealed. In this place, uh, I don't know too much about it, just that people kind of didn't take it seriously until there was a fire inside. Shinchenji Beer Hall fire. This was in, yeah, Mugyo Dong, Central Seoul. Uh, beer Hall on the second floor. Uh, just like the previous one, it was by Electric Short Circuit. But fortunately, um, nobody was inside at the time because it was a weekend and the place was closed for renovations. Uh, Jowon Disco Fire in Daegu um, was kind of a two story disco, and there were at least 25 deaths, many of them underage. Uh, and in fact, the emergency exit may have been locked to prevent the kids from leaving without paying. And many of them suffocated by toxic fumes and smoke, which, so they're like, you know, if you if you look at the, the victims of these, some of them are burned and charred, some of them are not. They're just, they inhaled too much smoke. And it, yeah, it's quite different. The evacuation was down a staircase that was 45 degrees steep, 1.4 meters wide. And when one of the escapees tripped on the stair stairway, those behind him stumbled and were caught in the blaze. Um, pretty horrific. The Common People Beer Hall fire, uh, this was, I think this was in Seoul, left 10 dead due to an oil stove that was kicked over during a quarrel. Um, and the emergency exits, once again, were locked from the outside. This happened at 4.20 a.m., which is very interesting, and we'll see an echo of that. Gosongguan nightclub fire in 1991 is, in, kind of, to my, in my opinion, the most horrific because it was caused by a guy who showed up. They wouldn't serve him because he was too drunk. He came back with gasoline, started a fire in the dance floor. This is him on the right. Um, I'm curious what his facial expression is showing there. Uh, and he killed at least 18 people. Um, mostly from, some of them actually burned up from uh, him lighting the fire, but many of them died in the, the stampede out the exit. Uh, so, um, pretty horrific. Rolling Stones fire hits closest to home. Uh, in 1996, uh, there was a fire that left 11 dead. Rolling Stones was a live music venue in Shincheon in Seoul. And after this fire, uh, the guy who owned it sold it to, I believe, his brother. And that guy moved, uh, moved it to uh, Hongdae and called it Rolling Hall. And Rolling Hall is still open, actually. Um, it's one of the medium-sized venues that has a capacity of about 300 people. Uh, that place is pretty nice, and I'm hoping to go in there and do an inspection after this lecture sometime. But uh, this fire in particular, um, yeah, was uh, the closest to like a home day venue. Um, so yeah, one of the problems was that fire trucks couldn't get in there because the alleys were too tight. 
and cars were parked, uh, you know, in the way. Uh, and it was caused by possibly somebody's like cigarette butt thrown into drying paint. The Incheon fire was uh, a really bad one. This is 1999. And I bet a lot of people here might even know about it or remember it. Um, it was like a bar for underage kids to come and drink. And uh, because, you know, everybody was afraid that these kids are going to run out without paying. Yep, yeah, they chained the door shut. Uh, so these kids were trapped inside when the fire started. The fire was sparked in a, a like, construction going on in the basement. Um, and yeah, at least 55 kids died and it had uh, extreme consequences. Much more, uh, it got much more attention than any of the previous ones that I've seen. And amazingly, uh, within a couple of weeks, um, there was a change made to the, uh, I'll get to it later, but the, uh, an act on like restaurants and zoning uh, that changed the way that these places are run. So like within about two or three weeks, uh, some some major uh, changes happen that still exist to this day. So alcohol and liquor license. I put this at the end of this section because it is relevant. Uh, when I went to Skunk Hell uh, in the mid 2000s, they never could sell alcohol. Um, and the reason was simple. They didn't have a liquor license. They didn't have a liquor license because they didn't have an emergency exit. That was it. So um, Instead, we would go across the street, we would cross the street to the 7-Eleven, buy our drinks, come back, drink in the club. Sometimes they would even leave like these giant bottles of soju or other liquor bottles that were secretly filled with soju and let anybody serve their own, serve themselves like their own liquor, including this girl who at the time was 14. Uh, she's now in her 30s, so don't worry, you can't, you can't rat on her. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was uh, basically a strategy to demonetize the place. And because of not having a liquor license to earn money, uh, they could never afford the renovations to make an emergency exit. After it closed and it became Morie Kotu, those guys installed an emergency exit and they could legally serve drinks, have live music, whatever they wanted. Um, during the pandemic, um, we've been told that live music venues can't serve alcohol. And in the times that that has been enforced, we just go out to the convenience store and drink in front out there. So we're going to move on to hygiene, um, which is uh, very important. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a fad called gobbing that happened in the early punk days. Apparently two punks were just kind of goofing around arguing and they started spitting on each other. And then so this kind of took off like people who idolized them were like, that's cool. And then journalists were like, a thing that punks always do is spit on each other. So when bands would go to perform, they'd come on stage and everybody would start spitting on them. There'd be like a rain shower of spit. Uh, and uh, Joe Strummer from The Clash claims that he probably got hepatitis because somebody spat into his open mouth when he was singing. Adam Ant, who's fairly well known, I think, uh, famously wore an eye patch because he had an eye infection from somebody spitting in it. Susie of Susie and the Banshees that she's had both diseases. She got pink eye and she got hepatitis from being spat on. And Captain Sensible of the band The Damned apparently wore a hat for because of the spit. Uh, I have a picture here of Monkey P Quartet's uh, guitarist. Don't worry, that's not spit on him in his glasses. This was in December and uh, we, we were all coming inside from the cold and our, our lenses would fog up. In the summer, it's even worse because you go in and it's a sauna and the walls are dripping with sweat and it's disgusting. But toilet facilities, we need to talk about this. There's a, a French musician who used to be active here and he had this uh, sticker to advertise his band where he would, he would go into the, the washroom of a venue and he would post this thing in the washroom stall and he would rate the, the toilet qualities. This is GBN, it got a one out of five. Uh, another club got 3.5 out of 5s, and he said it was a great one. Um, so you can see, like, the, the venues, like, uh, one of them, this one is squatter only. This one, it has a urinal and a toilet. But that means two guys go in at once, both of them pee all over everything. And where do women go? So pretty disgusting. I spoke to an uh, academic who didn't really want to uh, name herself, but... Uh, yeah, she uh, had actually talked to some uh, girls in the punk scene about washroom problems. Uh, none of them have been as forthcoming to me because I'm a guy, you know. But uh, she told me that, like, she personally, like, got used to finding alternative bathrooms. Like, 
you know, going outside, leaving the venue, finding another place to go. Um, and she said she got good at hovering. So yeah, clear reference to the squatter at some places. Uh, but she said also it wasn't just cleanliness that bothered her, it was like the location. Like uh, there was one venue that, uh, did, yeah, Thunder Horse, no longer there, uh, where the door to the washroom didn't shut and it was a little too far away so you couldn't grab it. So she would station a friend outside when she was in there. Um, and these are things that people would go through in order to go to go to concerts. Uh, it's quite awful, and these kinds of things uh, make it harder for women to be involved in the music scene. Like when I went to shows in Muledong, um, it felt like the scene was like 80% guys. And I think over several years, like women just were like, I could go to the Muledong shows, or I could go to shows somewhere else. And they just, you know, would gravitate towards other places, and it had an effect on the scene. Um, while I was putting this uh, together, I went to one venue, I won't name it, but I was inside the washroom and when I went to leave, door handle came off in my hands and I was trapped inside for about 10 minutes. So considering what I was there for, yeah, I found that very telling. I actually called for help and they were trying to work on opening it from the outside, but I just put that knob back over the spike sticking up and I was able to turn it and escape myself. So what can be done about this? There's not much. GBN published a toilet map where they offered several suggestions of where else you could go to use the washroom. They also replaced one of the uh, squatters with a toilet that has no leg room. So uh, I, I think that was even worse. Pandemic is an important part of hygiene at venues, obviously. As soon as the uh, pandemic happened, we had event cancellations. Uh, venues have tried being active with all sorts of social distancing rules, but it's never clear. And the consequences, if there were an outbreak, it would, it would be virtually the end of the live music scene. Like uh, we saw what happened, like Itaewon had an outbreak at gay clubs and everybody hated Itaewon. Like Itaewon suddenly had, all the restaurants were empty after that. Uh, and I don't know if the live music scene would recover even as well as Itaewon has. So if there was an ever, ever an outbreak at an actual concert and there hasn't been, then um, I, I fear what would happen. There has been an outbreak in Hongdae, but it didn't involve live music. This is a long list of precautions. You can see like a lot of the things. On the left, these are the kind of obvious things like people started having advanced tickets only, 50 people capacity, temperature checks at the doors, masks and face shields inside. Face shields didn't really work out. Ending shows early. And another really weird thing that happened, some venues realized like curfew is like, let's say nine or 10 to 5 a.m. So, hey, let's open up at 5 a.m. and serve drinks. So um, that actually happened at, at some live music venues. They would they would open up at five in the morning. Uh, quote from a, a friend commenting on this, because they can be doing that. Um, seating was added to venues uh, in order to comply with some of the regulations and alcohol sales were completely forbidden. Uh, as was drinking inside. So we would just go upstairs and drink out front. And also there's a, a, been a big switch to online shows. So there's a lot more of these. Uh, the second column is all suggestions from uh, somebody who had a show recently that was dogged by uh, district office uh, people stopping by often. A lot more extreme ideas like the performers wear masks, which they, they haven't at a lot of other shows. They have to be acrylic plates behind the microphone and the musicians can't move around. and all sorts of things. Um, I had a few other ideas. We're not gonna go into that because it's too much. I wanted to point out a few things. Face masks, there's been compliance problems in other countries. In Korea, it's been great because a lot of us were wearing face masks as a fashion statement before the pandemic. This guy on the right here, um, he was wearing this when he performed. Uh, this is in 2004. So yeah, this is just part of the culture. Uh, this guy here, his name is Ba jo Woo, and he's uh, now a famous uh, uh, fashion designer. Um, and his signature has always been a face mask, even if he rips it. Um, face shields were introduced uh, because the idea was, as an alternative to a face mask, you could drink under them. Didn't work. I, I have to say, I, I, I tried this, and I ended up going outside, putting my face shield down, and using it as a coaster. And then when I was going to go back inside, I realized, oh, why am I putting this back on my face? So I stopped using it. Fortunately, they weren't mandatory. Face masks were seating. Uh, and uh, my question is, does seating keep us safer from infections? No, it doesn't, but it complies with zoning restrictions. 
which we'll get into next. Uh, you can see this is a hardcore show where normally people would be like knocking it, jumping and knocking into each other. They're just sitting. Um, and uh, here's Club FF where they put tables in and chairs. And it's, yeah, they try to say like nobody can stand up, uh, which has been a very hard thing for anybody to enforce. Um, of course, as I mentioned, you can always go outside and just stand to the side and drink or whatever. Um, so there's not much of a problem. So QR codes, when you get your QR code scanned, I went to a show once and a few days later, I got this uh, text message saying that sometime during this time at Club FF, there was an exposure. And uh, so people were freaking out. And then the, uh, the promoters made a statement saying, no, there was not a confirmed case there. FF opened at 5 a.m. the next morning, and a person who came to that was infected. The infection does not travel back in time, so we were safe. And then later after that, it just kept happening. There kept being more cases, and Club FF eventually had to close. Uh, I don't think it's been opened since. I, I don't think it's gone out of business, though. It'll be back. Um, zoning, next. Okay, so an important thing about zoning is summed up in this little burner. I went to this venue and they had a burner with a pot on it. And I was like, so you guys serve food? And they were like, oh, no, no, no. I was like, why is that there? And they were like, I have no idea. Uh, the reason is because live music venues are zoned as restaurants. And that means they have to have kitchen facilities. So a lot of these venues do have these places. They have kitchen facilities. They also should have chairs. So chairs and kitchen facilities are kind of the things up until 1999, live music venues as we know them were illegal. And there was a thing called the Live Club uh, Undong, or legalization movement. And musicians were considered entertainment workers that are like outsiders brought in to like entertain the people. And you had to be a heavily taxed like entertainment facility, like a nightclub or a room salon to have this happen. So in 1999, the revision uh, to the Food Sanitation Act made musicians not entertainment workers so they could work in restaurants because there's no real designation for live music venues unless they want to get taxed really high. So that's the current situation. Venues are still, um, most of them, uh, under the Food Sanitation Act. Um, and they're still technically restaurants. And restaurants cannot have live performances unless they have like uh, Higap or uh, Chusun Janchi kind of thing. So the phrase chusun tanchi has, has come up a lot as like um, an expression to mean live music venues. Um, because that's the loophole. They were allowed to exist in this blind spot uh, so that, uh, you know, the, the authorities would just kind of be like, yeah, whatever, you, we'll just pretend like it's like that, whatever. And these non -size, uh, not these one size fit all restrictions have backfired during the pandemic because now, you know, this exception is basically being rescinded. And these places, if they were to open, they would have to be more like restaurants. And that's not happening. Um, so uh, how are we for time? I might skip by this. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people didn't like it. Um, but notice at the bottom, a, a DPK representative, Yu Jongju, uh, says that there might be a live club act. Let's hope so. Um, so some of the other people, yeah, uh, like John Bum Son of John Bum Son, Son and the Young Bands said basically like, you know, live clubs and restaurants are so different. Uh, but why does the law say they're the same? And Kim Min Jung of Ego Function Air, who just had a show a couple of weeks ago, uh, said basically it's pathetic to see the current indie scene in 2021. So um, yeah, basically the same thing, like the performance ecosystem is not protected in Korea. Shin Dae Chal, uh, son of, oh, I gotta reformat these uh, quotation marks. Son of Shin Jun Hyun and uh, himself a, a famous performer, said the solution is to establish a legal definition of a place called Live Club. And he wrote this like a couple months ago. <laughs> They've had 20 years to figure it out. So yeah, sustainability. The monetization of these places is terrible. Like these are passion projects like you know, a guy will just like keep a club open and he'll rely on his friends to, uh, you know, like give donations to keep the club go going. And it's it's brutal. That's what happened to Skunk Hell. 
Uh, supply and demand has always been a difficulty because people always want to open venues and we just aren't having more people coming. And gentrification is hurting really badly. So the only places to get like money when you do a concert is like, like a deal for the venue. Let's say I'm a promoter and I want to put on a show. I got to rent a venue which will be like, it could be like 900,000 won or something for uh, a small place on a, on a Friday or a Saturday. Um, or you can do a 50-50 door split where you split with the, the venue owners, like, you know, the profit, profits from people paying to get in. Or it could be a donation box. There's also a merch table where people can sell, like, their CDs, shirts, uh, zines, things like that. Uh, if you're lucky, there could be uh, a beer tap where they can sell stuff. Here's an example at Suwon uh, Alleyway, no relation to the Guangzhou place, where um, the they basically, they wouldn't charge people to come in, everybody would drink heavily, and then they would pass around a tip jar for the bands. So this was the equivalent of uh, paying a door cover. Venues face a really bad time also. Like, it's not just like they're charging promoters too much money. Club Ta, which was a place in Hongdae, uh, had to close its doors in 2016 when the uh, building owner tripled their rent, just like from one month to the next, we're going to triple it. So I, I was actually leading a tour of the Hongdae area and uh, for the Royal Ashidic Society, and we walked by this place and I was like, hey, it's closed. And, I, and we walked inside and saw this. This was part of a tour. Um, Skunk 2 uh, existed through donations, as I said, and then finally closed in 2009. And GBN Livehouse is an aging building that's showing cracks. So, like, these places are, are facing, like, you know, horrible crises for, uh, for these sorts of things. Duty Bun was a noodle restaurant in Hongdae area, and on Christmas Eve 2009, they were violently evicted. Uh, to make way for, um, there's now like an, uh, a department store there. Um, but they started a, a sit-in protest that lasted 521 days. Uh, in this little restaurant, you, you, this little building here, you can see a three-floor floor place. Uh, the ground floor became like, was the restaurant, it became like a hangout place. Second floor was for people sleeping. Third floor was practice room for musicians, which was this room and included that awful stage for only the drummer. This is the ground floor. Um, and musicians of the area rallied around it because it was a non-commercial space they could go to any time of night. They could practice there, they could have shows, they could hang out, they could even sleep if they were close enough to the people. Um, and they really aided the anti-eviction protest. Uh, and this was a turning point in Hongdae gentrification. This is when they started seriously looking to other neighborhoods. Um, and we used to talk about the home day music scene, but we don't any well, we don't anymore, but uh, sometimes it's advertised as that by gentrifying factors to make it sound really attractive. It's not. Um, and it led to a new generation of music that was spread out a little bit more throughout the city. If uh, you get a chance, track down the documentary Party 51 that is really nice and up close and shows this whole process. Um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. So. I want to bring up a problem as I went through all the, this, uh, these problems, like, first of all, it's kind of, it builds legitimacy to have these conditions. Like if you go to a punk venue and it's like an office building, that's, it's not legitimate. Um, so, and it keeps the price low. So if you were to like take these venues, the owners, if they were to move into nicer places, the audiences wouldn't come. Some of the people in that audience would open the old places and they would probably go on business as usual. So, like, there's not really a, an easy way to lift the venues out of these conditions. I would want to say that they deserve legal status through a live club act. They deserve liquor sales. Community growth and regional development are very important. Uh, everybody should support your own local scene, including the one in Guangzhou. Uh, I was really hoping to, uh, that we would have concerts to go to tonight after this, but of course we can't. Uh, so anyway, thank you. Uh, and we've reached the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. You this was, wow, I, there were so many new things that I learned and I just realized that I got so carried away with the presentation I didn't take off my mask.
<laughs> I'm taking it off right now. Really, thank you for an amazing talk. We have some comments coming in also in the chat room. I'm missing Hongde. Thank you. Yes, I'm pretty sure that many of our listeners might have some memories from Hongde. So first, of course, I will ask if there are any questions, you can type them in the chat room or if anyone would wish to unmute themselves and just ask questions directly, that is also okay. If you have a question, if you have any, any comment, if there is something that you would, personal experience that you would like to share, I'm pretty sure that our speaker, John, would really love to share. The, the, to, pardon me, not share, but to talk about some, some previous experiences together. So while we're asking, for, while we're waiting for some questions, I would like to be the first one. As always, I'm very impatient. <laughs> I would like to be the first one to, to start uh, the, to start the Q&A session, if you don't mind, and since there are no other questions. It seems like you don't mind. So in very, very near the end, when you were talking about Hongdae, you mentioned new generation of underground music. Yes. Could you tell us about like what do you mean by that? Okay. New generation of underground music? It was interspersed a little bit through that um, the lecture actually. And in fact, I would say it's an old generation now. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, some of the main organizing musicians in the duty band protest included uh, the grindcore band Bonsam Pirates, which isn't really active anymore, but has had like, they've been in at least two documentaries now. Um, there was also um, Dan Pian Sun, who's a very famous folk musician. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, the noise musician Pak Da Ham. Uh, and I, I remember he, in co collaboration with one band that started later, won a Korean Music Award. Uh, and I can't remember the guy's name right now, unfortunately, but there, there was a, a really good blues singer who came out of the scene too. And in the early 2010s, we had like uh, a pretty uh, promising uh, blues music scene in, in Korea. Uh, not just Seoul, but like, a, yeah, definitely Busan also. Um, and these were all kind of like multidiscipline musicians who were banded together in this really weird space and, you know, kind of where normally we separate like, you know, not just like punk, but like a certain type of punk here, a certain other type of punk there. And then like having these bands performing together was really interesting. Um, a lot of those guys went on and uh, have opened other like venues in other parts of the city, like the Mule Dong uh, venues were opened by some of these guys. Mm -hmm. They formed the independent musician collective Jadip, which was, they were the ones that were doing the shows in the photo studio. Oh, um, yeah. And the, the, that guy Pak Da Han uh, now runs a really cool place called Shindoshi mm -hmm. in Uljiro in like a, an old industrial building. Uh, so like a lot of the kind of trends after Hongdae gentrification and the whole exodus uh, started from that place really. Okay, I see, that is very interesting. I mean, just seeing that one line in your presentation, I was like, why did you not talk a bit more about that? So that's why I, yeah. why I asked the question. To be honest, I, I don't really want to like try to turn this into like, you should listen to punk or anything like that, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I, I want this to be, first of all, because this should apply to other types of music too. But uh, yeah, I, I don't really want to preach like, this is the music you should listen to or not. It's just, um, you know, if we take the music and the loud noise out, then what will we discuss about these places? <laughs> this is this is your talk. Of course, you can preach whatever you would like. And yeah. I, I really enjoyed listening. And I'm pretty sure our other listeners did since they're all still here. OK, we have another question, which I will read out now. And of course, I have more questions. I'm, uh, <laughs> I always have my own questions prepared. OK, we have another from Meline, impressive research. Do you miss those times? By those times, probably yes, pre-corona and like maybe back old days. My 20s. Your 20s, yeah. OK. Like, I, I miss that. I miss going to Skunk Hell when I was in my 20s, when I could like stay out all night until the first subway of the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, like I, I miss that. I miss what Hongdae was like. But I, I also like the way that things have evolved. Like. You know, I've gone to shows this year and sitting around with my friends, uh, 
seems just like it did back then. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I feel like I'm not really missing anything so much as seeing, you know, how it grew up. And I really like that. Okay, and that goes exactly, that fits very well. Thank you for your answer with our next question. There seems to be no loosening of COVID restrictions in sight. Do you think live music venues can recover quickly assuming restrictions are lifted? I think it depends on how they're restricted, uh, lifted. Mm -hmm. Like if the pandemic were to end, uh, a lot of bands have been spending this time practicing and writing new songs, making album releases, albums and stuff that they need to release and sell at shows. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there'll be a lot of bands that are going to be really willing to return. I'm not too sure how, you know, paying customers are going to return. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how many venues will be left. Mm -hmm. uh, probably only a few. Um, so I'm not too sure. One of the things that we are looking forward to uh, is... Uh, a beach festival called It's a Fest. Like mm -hmm. having festivals return will be an interesting thing. I don't talk about festivals because they're very different from these these venues, but uh, some of my friends organized like a beach fest uh, in Incheon mm -hmm. and it was, it started in 2019, was canceled last year and they really hoped to have it during Chuseok this year. Uh, actually it would have been this weekend. Yeah, September 11. Um, but it didn't happen. So uh, everybody, all these people are ready to go. It's just a question of, you know, will there be people to watch still? Like, will people want to return to, to these places? Or, you know, will be there be new people? I, I really don't think so. I think it's going to continue shrinking. Oh, no. Well, <laughs> I, I was just about to say that. So we have a positive, we have a positive uh, thing to, you know, wait for seeing, like, having in mind that probably all the mus musicians and bands have been practicing very diligently, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, of course you haven't mentioned festivals before, but I love festivals also. I mean, I love music. I am not really, really, punk is not my number one choice, but yes. I also love rock, metal. I love, I like the heavy sound. So I love festivals also. So I've been missing festivals a lot. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't care for festivals because you show up and it's really big and the musicians sometimes are separated from you. And oh, I don't yeah. like that, you know, so, yeah, so I don't course. like seeing security at shows. <laughs> True that. Yeah. It's, it's quite, it's quite different from what you've been talking about. Today. Yes, it is. Let's, let's not stay uh, with, the, <laughs> with the festivals. Let's see, do we have any other questions? If not, I will continue if you don't mind asking some questions that I've pre-prepared. So, this might be a bit of a personal question as well. I don't know, when was the last time you could go home to Canada? When was the last time you could visit? Pre-corona, probably? Probably. I'm afraid to leave because uh, they have that, they have all those things you have to do, like you have to apply to leave. Yeah, and if you do it wrong, you lose your visa. Course, and I'm like, it's understandable. Yeah, I have an F5 permanent residence visa and I, I don't want to <laughs> have that ever come anywhere near being same destroyed. Same here, same yeah. here. But I was really wondering if you could, I, I'm hoping that you have some friends back at home who could maybe tell you how is punk scene back at home surviving as compared to Korea during these pandemic times? They're opening up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think they've started to have shows because there's a high vaccination rate. But in my province, uh, they're just, they're planning to like remove all restrictions and their their cases are once again very high. So oh. I don't have a lot of faith in what's happening over there. I see. I was just wondering if you have some comparison, if you have some some sort of like positive results at home so that you can like give advice of what should what yeah. should be done in Korea to have them open again. They're so different than, you know, like different culturally that uh, I, I think we're actually a lot better off here. Like we have had concerts up until, you know, the Delta variant, really. Like there were there was a time, I guess, from last December for a few months, there was a period to about march or april um and then we had shows again for a short while and not a single person ever uh spread an infection at any of the shows um so yeah i, I think that it's shown that you know the live music scene despite its reputation for everything uh knows how to um social distance yeah, yeah. Indeed, that is something positive. And once again, before before we wrap up, if there are no other questions, I will have one last question, or maybe two. But I would really like to thank you for sharing these 
important research results. I mean, I couldn't even imagine before actually listening to your presentation from how many uh, different and important aspects go into all of this, you know, as someone who has never done deep research into it, I was thinking, yes, there might be this and this, but it's really a, a complex, um, complex web of many, many tiny details that actually go into, um, into what you researched about. Sorry, so if yep. there are, okay, we have another question. How can we encourage the government to create an act for live music? That is what I'm curious Interesting as question. Well. Um, I don't really know. I think probably the best way is actually social media at the moment, like uh, to support uh, people who are using their voices about this, mm -hmm. to spread the word yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there has, after Shinde Chen made his uh, post, there were a, a number of articles about the issue and there was quite a lot of discussion among musicians about what should be done. Mm -hmm. I was actually amazed, like this stuff, I'm, I'm trying really hard to grasp, especially the, uh, the zoning things and like registering as a restaurant. And like all these musicians like just spoke about it like it was just second nature and they hated it. So um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, social media messages is gonna be the best way. Uh, talking about it in, like in the media, uh, like not just social media also is important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the conversation is a little more quiet now, but uh, you know, uh, a few months ago it was it was quite a bit louder. So yeah, I don't know, we, yeah. Other than that, I don't really know too much about political engagement. As a foreigner, I think we're not supposed to do too much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I think it's it's fine to like, share an article or share a musician's post and things like that. That's that's what I would be saying to do. Thank you for your answer and thank you for a really good question. Yeah. Yes, usually what I what I say here when it comes to many other things that we want to draw attention to, really in the age of social media, everyone is like, oh, one hashtag won't do a lot. Yes, one hashtag will do something, hashtag, or as you just mentioned, sharing an artist's post or sharing something new about the live music scene. It could be, it could be influential. You never know, Your uh, our tiny part can grow to something big. Speaking about a tiny part, I know that we're two minutes over, but I just, I'm sorry, I cannot help but actually ask a bit about your book. Would you, oh, mind, yeah. would you mind that? Sure, of course. <laughs> just, just for a little while. Yeah. Um, was, right oh, you have oh, By the way, it says on the back, uh, I now, it quotes Guangzhou News with Will's uh, review. So, <laughs> yeah. So yes, I, I actually was curious from the very beginning to, to ask about uh, writing the book. Was that, I know the, the most basic question was, what was the inspiration behind it? But yeah. Ooh, was yeah. the, is question. the book for you a way to like draw attention to the problem? Or can you tell us what was the, well, in, the main thought really, behind it? The book came first. Mm -hmm. um, and like, uh, first of all, one of my friends, actually one of the ones pictured in, in this uh, presentation at one point, mm -hmm. released a photo book uh, of like the Korean punk scene in back in the, these old days that I remember too. And apparently people got really angry because it was like, hey, that, that shows me with my ex or, you know, that shows me before I got plastic surgery and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, that makes me afraid to release a similar book, which I could do. Um, so I thought fiction, fiction will make me safe. Uh, so I, I went with that, but the original thing that, uh, that there was actually a weird incident that led to the creation of this book where I put on a show, uh, in, uh, 2017, I think, uh, yeah, um, uh, where I brought a musician from Canada and, uh, one of my friends who was at that show, uh, the next morning, he was found unconscious in a pile of blood, a pool of blood in an alley. Uh, and we all thought that he had been beaten up. He was in the hospital. He didn't remember what happened. So I, I had to go, uh, like, I, he, he sent me the pictures that were in his camera. So I was able to reconstruct his steps from after he left us. Um, and it turned out he fell off a roof, but um, <laughs> like a, a two-story roof. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the process of like, thinking like, is there somebody in our music scene who would do this to a person? It really made me like suddenly like turn my eyes, you know, onto these kinds of issues. And it led to the the, the idea of fire in particular. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and as I was doing that, I realized like I need to learn as much as possible about this topic. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's that's where it comes from. <laughs> hey, that was very interesting. Thank you. I was quite shocked with this story. Okay, so I think there are no other questions. We have one comment. Thank you for your great presentation. It is a good chance to let me know about other fields. Definitely, definitely. Some, something quite unique and quite new for all of us, I believe. So really, thank you for taking the time before we really really finally wrap up now would you like to share some final thoughts and final comments anything that you might want to ask our listeners or oh. your final comments yeah <laughs> one thing i am very curious about is how the situation is in guangzhou for live music venues uh like if they if they have the same restaurant restriction thing and everything mm -hmm. uh so also i i am hoping we can look at that and maybe have a guangzhou news article in the future okay. but uh as well uh when possible i encourage everybody here to you know just go like when it's safe like go see a concert uh, maybe find what kind of music you like support korean musicians support your local scene that's how I want to end it. <laughs> That's a great comment. Okay, let me see. Is there anyone who would like to raise their hand and say something about the Guangzhou music scene? Again, I'm not pushing. I'm just curious. Some final comments from the audience. Yeah, I want to know more about it. <laughs> If not, that's also okay. Let's just wrap it up here then. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this presentation. It was a really unique presentation, really unique research and very, very in-depth research. And thank oh. you for sharing all of that with us. Um, thank you for also joining right here at Kwangju International Center, not only online. Uh, hopefully when all of the restrictions with uh, relate in relation with COVID-19 are lifted, we can meet in person as not, not only when it comes to music, but when it comes to the GIC talk itself. So maybe yeah. we can have a bit more interactive, um, interactive talk once again. Thank you very much for today's talk. Thank you everyone for joining us today on this lovely Saturday afternoon. I wish you all a lovely Saturday evening, an amazing rest of the weekend. Rest a lot, enjoy a lot, take care of your health. And of course, before we finish, I would just like to introduce next week's GIC talk. The title of our next week's GIC talk is Studying Abroad, the Best of Experiences. Our speaker is David Richter from Germany. I hope I'm pronouncing that well. As David started to learn English through the influence of American television and his growing interest in American football, and after starting college, he decided to do semester abroad in the U.S. His presentation tells the story of how going to the U.S. led to attending multiple studies abroad and the whole experience that came with it. So everyone who would like to know a bit more about David's experiences, please join us next Saturday as well with another GIC talk. Wish you all a lovely day. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I will see you again next Saturday. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, John. <laughs> uh, is my camera still on?